Hello and good evening to all our guests who are joining us uh, in Europe and I would imagine a range of greetings. Good morning, good midday to our friends in the United States and South America and perhaps good night. We're ready to talk you in bed if you are in the Middle East and South Asia and Southeast Asia. It is an absolute pleasure to welcome you all. And of course, first and foremost, welcome our tonight's um, speaker, Dr. Nargis Bajokli. My name is also Nargis uh, Farzad, and I wear several hats. I am the senior lecturer in Persian and uh, chair of Center for Iranian Studies. And with my wonderful a tireless colleague, Dr. Dino Mata, Chair of uh, Center for Palestinian Studies. We put together the lectures um, famously known on our Tuesday evening Middle East series lectures for the London Middle East Institute. Uh, it's uh, our last uh, lecture of term one, and it really is wonderful to be able to have a speaker who knows her field so well and has been a student of this field as well as now a scholar and a teacher. Uh, Nargis Bonjogli is a wonderful, she's really home from home because I think Nargis John was in the early uh, 2000s, I think, that she spent what was then called as the junior year abroad at uh, SOAS with us. Um, as you know, we always say that the speaker needs no introduction, but this is really indeed true of Nargis. Um, Nargis is currently uh, assistant professor at the uh, University of uh, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Middle East Studies at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. She is not just an award-winning uh, writer, but she is also a filmmaker and writes outside academia as well. Uh, she is a regular contributor to the media, global media, including BBC World Service and um, uh, all the US and other um, uh, media outputs. Uh, as you know, we try to invite our guests to this lecture series who have had a book published in the um, you know, uh, in the past uh, 12 to 14 months. And uh, we've been trying, in fact, to get Nargis for a while, but she has a lot of teaching and research commitments. So finally, she very graciously squeezed us in at the end of her teaching term. And the reason that we're very keen to have Nargis speak to us is the uh, book, her recent book, which is Anxieties of Power, in the Islamic Republic, Iran Reframed. So the main uh, title is Iran Reframed. And it is extraordinarily fascinating that Nargis' uh, research for this book was very much in situ. And many of the people who feature in her book are people who she uh, interviewed in person. Um, I know that in these days of online access, you can all look like this up and read her extraordinary output for such a young academic. So I won't take any of her time. And I know you're not here to listen to me. So Nargis John, as you know, it gives me an absolute personal as well as institutional pleasure to welcome you back home. It is, of course, online, but I feel you are back at SOAS. Thank you for accepting our invitation and the floor, the internet, the Wi-Fi is yours. And also, of course, all you people out there, I have to apologize that if I disappear or my screen goes peculiar, is because the landline, do you remember landline, those good old days? will ring and when that happens my internet drops so if i disappear you need not worry because wonderful aki alborzi who of course i should have thanked first and foremost will be at the helm and nargis will talk away so i should put myself on mute but i present uh, dr nargis Bajokli to you 
Thank you so much, um, Nayagashan. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I, I only wish that I could be uh, present and, and with you all in person at SOAS. It's one of my favorite places on the entire planet. Um, that year that I spent there, I learned so much and I go back to thinking about it constantly. Um, I, I really appreciate this invitation. I love uh, being here with all of you and I look forward to your questions. Um, I also really want to thank uh, uh, Professor Nagas Farzad and Professor Dina Matar for inviting me to this, uh, to give this talk and Aki Alborzi for all of the help that he's given throughout um, as, as we're getting ready for, for the talk today. I just want to quickly apologize because I have a dog who's gotten a little bit older and he will maybe be snoring. So if you hear snoring, it's him. Um, and I do have a little daughter who's out right now, but in case she barges in, you'll you'll sort of know who, who that is. Um, I'm going to give a brief talk about the book as I've been asked to do. I'm going to share some images as well um, for about the first half of the talk and I'll take it back down. I'll stop sharing my screen at that point. So let me just pull that up for you really quickly. Um, and then we can get started. Um, oops, hold on one second. I think I have the wrong one up. There we go. Okay. So I was uh, sitting in a production meeting with a group of commanders of the Revolutionary Guard uh, who were in charge of media production in Iran. About 20 minutes into the discussions of the films that they were going to be producing for the new Iranian year, one of the commanders in the room said, this youngest generation doesn't uh, care about our religious language anymore. We're wasting our time with the things that we make. They don't care about it. That's why so many of them were in the streets protesting against our system last year. It had been just over, ooh, let's see if I can change this. There we go. It had been just over two years since the 2009 Green Movement in Iran, which at that time was the biggest mass uprisings in the country since the 1979 revolution. I had joined these men in numerous meetings since that uprising, and in each they contemplated what had made so many young Iranians come out into the streets and the numbers that they had. And the demonstrations went from where is my vote to very quickly turning into slogans of down with the dictator. The slogans of the 2009 Green Movement were actually eerily similar and some were facsimiles to the 1979 slogans of the revolution. Uh, demonstrations in which many of the men in the Revolutionary Guard had participated in as teenagers at the time. In that same meeting that I spoke about, one commander of the Revolutionary Guard, whose wife and children had joined the sea of protesters in 2009, said to his colleagues, these kids don't care about the revolutionary stories we've told them the past 30 years, and that's our fault. We can't blame them. We haven't properly communicated our stories to them. We need to bring them back to our side by telling them better stories. Now, what does it mean to have the commanders of Iran's most powerful military apparatus, the very force in charge of defending the revolution, admit that the majority of the population no longer understands the regime's revolutionary and religious language? My book starts with the classic paradox of any successful revolutionary movement, namely, how does the commitment from a revolutionary project get transmitted from one generation to the next as historical circumstances change? Or to put it in different terms, what happens when a revolution becomes the status quo and the, the revolutionary government then tries to com communicate the commitment to a revolution to its younger generations without inducing them in creating a new revolutionary movement against what has now become the status quo. So to answer this, I did field work over a 10 year period in Iran with the Bastige paramilitary organization and the Revolutionary Guard, and in particular with their media and cultural producers, in order to understand how they envision the future of the Islamic Republic as it enters its fifth decade. So what can we gain from understanding the Islamic Republic from those charged with communicating what it stands for? I started my research thinking that most of my time would be spent with Revolutionary Guard media producers on films and work that targeted those generations of young people who had risen up against the state in 2009. And while there was a lot of that, the discussions behind closed doors focus much more on heated debates among the different generations of the Revolutionary Guard and Vestige 
particularly the first generation who fought in the war, the war of the 1980s between Iran and Iraq, and who are now at the helm of power, and those who are the third generation of the revolution. And at the time that I was doing my research, they were mostly in their 20s and early 30s. So a big part of this book is looking deeply at generational changes in revolutionary systems. A revolutionary state has the dual project of appealing to citizens while simultaneously defining what the revolutionary project will mean over the long term. How to achieve this goal without losing the revolution altogether is a contentious question. Now, there's been such a wealth of scholarship on areas of resistance to the Islamic Republic, but our understanding of the state remain, remains two-dimensional, and our notions of those who make up Iran's arms and paramilitary forces are caricatures. And by shining an ethnographic lens on media producers of the Islamic Republic, I found a state, much like any state project around the world, and we can see this much more clearly now in the COVID era, that is in the constant process of becoming. The concerns of the men of the Islamic Republic and those who helped create its vast media output were not confined to religion and Islamic politics. Rather, they tended to focus on class, generational differences, and social mobility. So as much as this is a book about new media productions, it's also about deeper social phenomenon. Those who have viewed Iran's politics over the past 40 years exclusively through the lens of Islam have overlooked important social dynamics that undergird the regime. My findings led me to question not only the existing depictions of these men, but more generally the predominant frame of analysis when it comes to understanding the Islamic Republic. Since 1979, when revolution swept through a country that just one year prior, the US President Jimmy Carter had been in Tehran and had toasted as an island of stability, American policymakers and Western policymakers more generally have scrambled to understand an upheaval that not only blindsided them, but that expressed a deeply felt anti-imperialism as Iranians demanded independence from Washington. U.S. news media at the time of the revolution, and this is my newer project that I'm working on, described Iranian society as, quote, possessed by madness, and Iranians as blinded by a religious fervor and seeking martyrdom at all costs. Such explanations may have answered an immediate need to understand on simple terms and to undermine the revolutionary government and the aging Ayatollah at its helm. In essence, over time, this frame has had, an, had the effect of rendering the Iranian state and the revolution as irrational. But this framework, unfortunately, has not evolved much in the four decades since 1979, and it's left us really ill-equipped to understand the Islamic Republic today. What happens, I ask, if we reframe our study of Iran from the vantage point of the supporters of the Islamic Republic? If scholarly and public culture analysis has failed to understand the supporters of the Islamic Republic and all of their complexities over the past 40 years, what happens if we take a different approach to contemporary power in Iran? One that insists, as anthropology, the discipline from which I come from, demands on an actual curiosity about the positions and worldviews of the Islamic Republic on their terms. So as a bit of a big quick background, I'm not going to go too much in it because I know the audience here already knows much of this, but Iran has a bifurcated military apparatus. So there's the formal military or what's called the Ayatish and Persian that existed prior to the revolution. And Ayatollah Khomeini feared that this uh, military, the Ayatish would potentially stage a coup against him and, and the new revolutionary government once the Shah had left. And so they, he helped create the Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, in 1979 and throughout the 1980s in the Iran-Iraq war, the Revolutionary Guard got favored access and resources. And so by the end of that war, that eight year war, it developed into a parallel uh, military organization like the, like the formal military. Um, and the Basque paramilitary organization was created to recruit volunteers to the war front uh, for the war effort. In the post-war period, there has been a lot of emphasis on how and thinking about how to demobilize the paramilitary organization throughout the 1990s. And then there has been a lot of resources poured into them in fighting these soft wars that I'm going to get to in a little bit. Um, 
Now, uh, today also it's important to note that about 75% of the population is under the age of 40, meaning that they don't remember the revolution or the war, which are the two defining moments of the Islamic Republic. And for those who are social scientists in the audience or who study societies, you know how incredibly important foundational stories are to keeping state projects alive. To those who are looking at what's happening in the United States, for example, uh, all the controversy that's boiled up over the New York Times' 1619 project as fundamentally questioning the foundational story of the United States goes to show you how when foundational stories are either not remembered correctly or begin to be questioned, what an incredibly uh, destabilizing effect that can have as far as how to then uh, create a narrative about the state and what the state stands for. So foundational stories are crucial. And it, this was a really big part of the, of the discussions of what was happening in Iran when I was doing that research. Um, so Masoud Dehnamaki is the man with the megaphone in the middle of this picture. He's a founder of Ansar Hezbollah in Iran, and he's turned into one of the most commercially successful filmmakers in the country today. He started making films in the early 2000s. Uh, and he said in an interview, during the Iran-Iraq war, we had to shed blood for the revolution and we did. Later, we believed we should publish journals and books for the revolution and we did. Today, we think cinema best expresses our goals, so we make movies. But Dehnamaki was not just talking about technique. He's speaking about a wholesale shift in emphasis. For him, the quest to make uh, revolutionary subjects is a struggle to be waged in visual media. Dehnamaki represents a shift away from the blunt propaganda of the first two decades of the Islamic Republic to creating new entertainment to attract younger audiences. And it should be noted that Dehnamaki was in charge of leading uh, paramilitary forces to squash the student uprisings in the University of Tehran's dorm uh, University of Tehran overall, but especially the dormitories uh, in 1999. So he went from that kind of background to creating films that break uh, box office records over and over again. And so that shift to me was really fascinating. And I was following his blog at the time when people wrote more blogs. Um, and he talked about the need to create uh, uh, workshops for younger Basiji and Hezbollah members to create more films like his. And that's when I knew that this is this was the story that this was the research project I wanted to work on. And, and I wanted to understand how those workshops functioned. Now, first off, every government around the world creates propaganda. Some are just more savvy at producing it than others. And second, national militaries can be intimately involved with media production. A prominent example that scholars have long studied is the very close relationship between Hollywood studios, some Hollywood studios, and the US military. There are more recent studies out now by social scientists who look at the ways in which the Israeli and Colombian militaries, for example, are also active media producers. In the study of revolutionary government, scholars have done much work over the years on, on the Soviet, Cuban, Chinese cases, for example. And although there is much, much uh, amazing scholarship on research on Iran, one gap remains the media that's produced by the state, which spends the most money on media production in the country. Now, given how long it took me to gain access and what an inho inhospitable place Iran can be for long-term social scientific work, it's not surprising that we don't have much scholarship, especially in an ethnographic way that looks at this kind of media production. Now I'm going to very briefly talk about uh, methods because of the nature of this research. Um, and because I know that it's a question that people often have. As an anthropologist, I sought to do long-term research. I knew I didn't just wanna rely on interviews because like state elites the world over, they would only give me formulaic answers. And if I wanted formulaic answers, I could look in the newspapers, I could look at press releases. I wanted to go beyond that. I wanted to know not only about their work, but to see them produce it, to be present as their projects evolved, as they sat down in the, in the studios, their editing rooms, to understand where the funding was coming from because that was where the rich data was. But doing long-term participant observation in this project was not straightforward. I had been working on these issues for many years, it first in relation to war veterans uh, exposed to chemical war uh, weapons, as you can see in the slide that's up here. I directed an oral history project at the Tehran Peace Museum, which is the picture uh, that I'm in with some of the veterans and folks who, at the Tehran Peace Museum, and also directed a documentary film, The Skin That Burns, about chemical weapons survivors from the Iran-Iraq War. 
it was only because I had already worked closely with veterans exposed to chemical warfare for four years that I was later able to get my foot in the door with their media producers. In my earlier work with veterans, I got to know some of the main doctors and veterans involved in the care of the war wounded, and I showed them that I could be respectful of their worldview and empathetic to them as human beings, even if I did not agree with them. So once I had decided on this research, I mentioned it to them, and one of uh, them in particular, who was a war veteran turned physician, introduced me to key media makers throughout the country, uh, and especially in Tehran. And he told them that he trusted me, and it was only through this introduction from someone so well trusted within that world that I was able to get my foot in the door. Coming from what the regime considers a counter-revolutionary background with parents tied to the leftist movements of Iran and on my maternal side tied to high government positions in the Shah and Mossadegh's governments. And as an Iranian American, which we all know that the state sees as a potential spy or, and more and more so unfortunately lately with Iranians from diaspora and especially academics. It took another two years of constantly showing up at events and trying to set up meetings that I eventually convinced them to allow me into these spaces. I knew throughout that my social media presence, my writings, and even my cell phone conversations in Iran were being monitored during this early phase of research. Over time, I was granted full access, but I knew full well that the doors could shut on me at any moment. Yet what I did not expect was the degree to which the US government would attempt to curtail my academic freedom because I was doing research on a sanctioned country and because I'm a dual national. My university ended up spending tens of thousands of dollars on legal fees for me to be able to do this research, something that most universities would not be willing to do, especially for a graduate student at the time. And they ended up hiring a big uh, law firm in Washington DC to defend my right to do this research. In addition, as an Iranian American, my loyalties were constantly questioned by the US government. As we know, dual nationals are often the targets of aggressive foreign policy from Japanese Americans during World War II to Muslim Americans after 9-11. And I'm just talking about the US cases. I know there's much more in, in places like the UK and other, and other uh, parts as well. So this is an issue that, that is really an, uh, an issue that I think we need to con constantly talk about as researchers. As I wrote in an academic paper that I had come out last December, being a researcher that's seen as a national security threat is not just the domain of authoritarian regimes over there, but very much the domain of our governments right here as well. Nonetheless, I stood out in this environment uh, because I was the only woman, uh, female in most of the places that I was in. Even though I had spent a decade prior to this research living in Iran, there was no way that I could blend into this crowd. Not only is the world of the Revolutionary Guard and Bastige masculine, but the media world is especially masculinized. This is very different from the non-regime media world because Iran actually boasts one of the highest numbers of female directors in the world. And within the Bastige, there's actually a, a very large contingent of women in these organizations, but they do not focus on film production. They're much more involved in oral history recordings, writing of stories, and I'm happy to go into some of the gender dynamics of the media world uh, in the pro-regime sort of sphere during Q&A if anyone is interested. Methodologically, I was a participant observer in editing rooms, production meetings, uh, funding meetings on film shoots and during the subtitling of films. Since I was trained as a filmmaker myself, they took me more seriously throughout the whole process and asked me to participate in all the workshopping sessions about the different stages of the films that were being made. I also went on many domestic and international trips with different filmmakers and producers as they were distributing their work in order to get a sense of how they were presenting their work to different audiences. Now, we tend to think of the Revolutionary Guard and Basij as homogenous groups of men. When the Supreme Leader gives an order, it's followed down the line. However, what I discovered are men who work in ad hoc ways, fight over resources, and disagree with one another all the time. In other words, they were far from uniform or cohesive. And now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because um, that's the end of the slides. Um, one of my main interlocutors who in the book I call Mr. Ahmadi joined the 2009 Green Movement with his family. He's a veteran of the war and he had both of his legs blown off by a bomb. And so when he enters any kind of place outside of his home, he's very readily seen and identified as someone who is pro-regime. Now, what do I mean by that? 
Because of the way revolutionary citizenship was regulated based on dress in Iran, sartorial choices end up mattering not just for reasons of fashion per se, but because they signal some kinds of revolutionary belonging, the friend enemy divide that's been written a lot about in the Soviet and other cases. And in Iran, it's, it divides itself into the khodi or qayda khodi, the us versus them. And so when Mr. Ahmadi and his family joined the protesters in 2009, the Basijis who were in charge of suppressing the protest had begun to single out families like his. If the Green Movement was supposed to be anti-revolutionary, then people like Mr. Ahmadi and his family should not be a part of it, especially when they could be so visibly identified as being supporters of the regime, but yet also um, as, uh, a part of this Green Movement uprising. The, third, the first two days when he went out into the streets with his family, nothing happened to them. But by the third day, when they began to clamp down on the, on, and suppress the movement, uh, that day he got beaten. Uh, he was beaten so badly he got pushed, he got knocked out of his wheelchair. And a few weeks afterwards, he got kicked out of a very prominent cultural center by loyalist of then President Ahmadinejad during his second term in office. But Mr. Ahmadi was not dismayed. He believed that he and his cohort had just as much of a say over what the future of the Islamic Republic should look like as this youngest generation. And so he ended up opening his own production studio and started making regime media uh, for freelance. He started becoming a freelance uh, producer. And because of his connections within uh, the pro-regime world, he had access to different forms of funding and the ability to get the films that he was making and the content that his young filmmakers were making into television and uh, film uh, movies and um, uh, film festivals. By forefronting these issues, I'm able to show how contestation in the Islamic Republic is not just between the regime and the people or the old generation versus the young generation as, as it's often uh, sort of presented. Instead, through an ethnographic lens on the supporters of the Islamic Republic, this book illustrates how contestation in Iran today involves conflict over the very boundary of what the regime and the revolution are. Let me illustrate a bit what I mean by this intergenerational divide. Uh, so one afternoon, um, in, I was in central Tehran at the Art University, and I had been attending weekly meetings put on by the university's uh, Basij and Hezbollah organizations. Uh, and the student Bastij uh, organizations on university campuses is by far one of the most hardline um, elements on university campuses. And especially in the aftermath of the 2009 movement, they were in charge of uh, consistently looking out and trying to suppress any kind of organizing that was happening on campus. So in these meetings uh, at the art university, they would invite regime filmmakers to discuss and show their work um, and sort of have a workshop with them. And that day, they had invited someone in the book who I call Mr. Hosseini, who is a leading regime filmmaker and was a captain of the Revolutionary Guard. Mr. Hosseini is a leader in the first generation of Revolutionary Guard film producers, and he's trying to build a new media strategy to engage the young people who have protested against the green, uh, who have protested against the state and the green movement. During this meeting at the Art University, Mr. Hosseini was telling students in attendance that regime media had failed and that they needed to work on projecting a much more inclusive vision of the Islamic Republic to be able to reach out in a way and, and bridge the divide with the younger generation. Um, the leader of the student Basij organization got up in the middle of Mr. Uh, Hosseini's talk. He pointed his, his finger very angrily at him and he said, your generation may be tired of confrontation, but not ours. When we left that meeting, Mr. Hosseini turned to me really exacerbated and he said, these young Basijis don't realize that distancing ourselves from the general public is what got us into this mess that we now face. We need to reach out to the other side that's protecting us, not alienate them as these kids want. You know what their problem is? They don't know what it's like to be marginalized in society. They don't remember because they were born after the revolution. All they've ever known is a system in which our side has been in power. The leaders of the Islamic Republic's armed forces have more at stake today even than the defense of a political system. These men and their families did not command respect in Iranian society prior to 1979. The monarchy of Muhammad Reza Pahlavi formally marginalized religious families and the Iranian intellectual elite of the day and today continue to look down on them as well. The creation of the Islamic Republic gave pious Iranians of Mr. Hosseini's class and generation a sense of purpose and a place in society. 
I often heard them wonder aloud anxiously, if circumstances in the country changed, would they be driven to the periphery again? This is the central issue at the heart of protecting the Islamic Republic in Iran today among its supporters. It's about having a place in society, about counting and not being marginalized. And in essence, it's a question of power. So Mr. Hosseini continued, the younger Bastijis, and this is what he was saying to me after that meeting, the younger Bastijis don't know that if we don't take care of this revolution, we'll be relegated back to the margins of society. They don't know how quickly things can change. And that generation continually said these things to me because they remember how quickly things change in the revolution. And they thought that the youngest generation did not understand that power is not something to be taken for granted. Now, of course, in this endeavor, they've ended up marginalizing whole sectors of the population themselves, which presents the bigger problem in Iranian political and social life looking into the future. And yet, interestingly, Mr. Hosseini and his colleagues in the first generation didn't let their own children join the Basij, the very organizations that they had joined themselves as teenagers in the 1980s, because for them, they had now gone up on the social ladder and they saw their children joining the Basij as going down that social ladder that they had already scaled. So while this is about maintaining their place in society, deeper social phenomenon such as class and social and cultural capital have now led to divisions among the supporters of the Islamic Republic. So who are these younger Basijis and why is there such a divide? I slowly got to know the leader, the student leader of the Art University's Basij organization, the one who stood up and angrily pointed his finger at Mr. Hosseini in that meeting. Uh, I, I call him Mustafa in the book. Younger Basijis such as Mustafa feel that the revolution has gone astray because the older generation has lost touch with its values. Like many of his classmates in the university Basij organizations, Mustafa hails from a pious working class uh, and lower middle class family that migrated to Tehran from smaller towns across the country. When as a teenager, Mustafa wanted to pursue filmmaking, his family couldn't afford the ex expensive equipment necessary for photography and filmmaking, and they didn't have a wide social network in the capital that could help them. His father, who was a supporter of the Islamic Republic, encouraged his young son to join his high school's Vastige organization in the hopes that maybe they could help him get the camera and the necessary equipment. One of his mentors at the Bastige organization in his school had worked in film and photography previously and was able to provide the resources and social network that Mustafa's family could not provide for him in, this, in the capital. He ended up going to the art university and once he graduated with a degree in film, Mustafa easily found a job at a production house run by Bastijis that made documentaries for state television, allowing him to be a full-time filmmaker and to be able to provide a middle-class life at that time, pre-sanctions for his uh, wife, when, when he had just married. And the revolution offered Mustafa and his family a social mobility to which they saw the corruption of the older generation of revolutionaries as a threat. They're the ones who are soft, not us, Mustafa said to me. We appreciate their sacrifices during the war, but they've become corrupted by money and obsessed with making themselves like the secular elite. So central to these debates is not only what revolutionary stories to tell, but who can tell them? Who are the rightful heirs to the revolution? It's a question with ever shifting boundaries. In the book, I offer a range of media strategies that I observe them undertaking. And I'm going to really briefly just sort of go through them. There are three techniques. One is dissimulation. Dissimulation techniques are basically, they understood that anything that goes on state television or that they put out with sort of aesthetic markers that anyone who's watched uh, pro-regime media in Iran can very quickly say, oh, that's pro-regime media. So they uh, understand that people watch this and think that it's propaganda. So instead, what they've begun to do is to create films and to create media products where they try to remove their fingerprints. And so audience members are watching and they don't realize that what they're watching has been made by pro-regime uh, filmmakers and studios in Iran. This has become actually much easier today, actually. Um, and so at the time when I was doing my research, one of the ways that they would do this is that they would make films and, and copy them on VCDs uh, and DVDs, burned ones, and give them to the street sellers in, in Iran who sell banned uh, films. And this way people would buy them and think that they were buying underground films. 
today with social media having sort of moved in the speed that it has, they now are just creating internet television channels and social media accounts and, and uh, spreading and, you know, sort of putting on there different kinds of short media. And oftentimes people who are watching them, watching this media don't know who's produced it. And I've seen, especially in the past two rounds of uh, protests that have happened in Iran last November and the winter before that, that activists will oftentimes circulate this media that's being made from certain pro-regime forces in Iran that, that move forward some uh, protest against the regime, but not fully to the extent that the protesters have been. The second technique are new distribution techniques. Uh, so instead of putting things on television uh, in Tehran, for example, because they know, and as they said to me over and over again, anytime we put something on state television in Tehran, the diaspora media picks up on it and starts writing against it. So we don't want to allow them to do that. So what they do instead is that they begin to show a lot of this media in the provinces. They set up different kinds of film festivals, especially in places that don't have movie theaters. And they circulate the media first in this way, and they end up showing it in Tehran at the very end. Now, this is counterintuitive to any kind of media distribution strategy, whether in Iran or anywhere. It's as if, for example, you don't start showing your filmmaker in the UK, and you, you do deliberately don't show in London first, but you show in some of the smaller places. So this is very counterintuitive. Filmmakers don't want to do this, but they realize that in order to get more and more of the population to see this before outright dismissing it, they, they end up going from outside and then moving into the center. And the third is reframing their stories through nationalism rather than Shiism. So I saw them, uh, and, and this you could really see in the, in the aftermath of the Soleimani execution in, in January of 2020, um, where, where this really came to fruition. But they, um, using Soleimani, but also beyond Soleimani, move their media production from forefronting issues of Shiism for a domestic audience into forefronting issues of a national, Persian nationalism and moving uh, symbolic markers of Islam very much into the background. Now, nationalism has always been a part of the Islamic Republic's media output, but there is something that was fundamentally different to what was happening after 2009. And part of that was their, ability, was their desire to try to build a bridge to the younger generation who was uh, protesting against them. And the way that they thought to do that was to, uh, to make the Islamic Republic be a defender of the Iranian nation and Persian civilization rather than just the Islamic Republic. Now, in their external media products, which I don't talk about as much in this book, but what they export to Iraq, Lebanon, other places, Shiism is still very much at the forefront. So again, they're extremely nimble in the ways in which um, they, these different messages come out. Yet again and again, my conversations with members of the Revolutionary Guard and Vestige turned back to issues of corruption, social and cultural class, and generational differences. Often, my interlocutors turned their anger on one another much more than on those who are not supporters of the regime. Their vast and nuanced disagreements revealed a complicated political reality that cannot be contained in familiar binaries that are often used to describe Iranian politics, such as reformist versus hardliner or anti-regime versus pro-regime. I saw many folks who went from coming across as being reformist in one setting and then coming across as, as being more hardline in a different setting, depending on what was going on. So these, these identifying markers that we tend to use in English to talk about Iranian politics are much more fluid on the ground. In fact, in the aftermath of the nationwide 2009 protest last 2019 protest last November um, over an increase in fuel prices and the subsequent bloody suppression by the state, two of my main research interlocutors in the youngest generation, the third generation that I write about in the book, made public statements against the decisions of the state to clamp down. One of them at an award ceremony for a film that he had just made said in public, I've been to Syria. We've heard the refrain, be careful not to turn Iran into Syria. And it's true, but that refrain has always been directed at the people. Now it's time to direct that refrain and message to the heads of states. Be careful not to turn Iran into Syria with your actions. And so this is, this is actually something that's been developing since I finished my research, which is that this third generation is one in which the, the, the generation that's in power today is starting to have a lot of problems with because they actually cannot get them to stop criticizing them and, and figuring out what to do with that politically is, is becoming a big question. As the Islamic Republic enters its fifth decade, 
keeping the revolution alive will depend on the ability of its image makers not only to appeal to a younger population that wants change, but also to build consensus among members of the younger generation within the Islamic Republic's own ranks. The task before the post-revolutionary state in Iran is to win over a broad cross-section of its citizens while simultaneously defining what shape its revolutionary project and its state apparatus will take over the long term. In this dynamic, how best to achieve this goal without losing the Islamic Republic's founding vision altogether presents a reality in which everything becomes both a possibility and a problem. Now, in conclusion, the men who appear in this book, as well as their families, challenged everything I thought I knew about Iran, revolutions, and states. This book is not only about state media, but about the men who produce this media and what it means to doubt what they have fought for, not know what is to come, and be wrought with anxiety about the fact that they may be relegated back to the margins of society if their political project fails. Thank you so much. Fantastic, Nagis John, Dr. Bajogli, really amazing. I'm just trying, as you were speaking, I was trying to visualize, just would have loved to have been a fly on the wall during all that period when you were there. And, uh, you, you know, in many ways, so perhaps extraordinary for them to have a, a filmmaker, a female brought up outside Iran to, you know, um, uh, be with them, look at them, research them. It must have been just an extraordinary, that in itself is a, you know, your travel log must be <laughs> quite worthy of reading. There are uh, several questions. It's uh, really, you've touched upon so many topics that uh, each one is um, enough to start a different lecture. I mean, I, for me, uh, what really leapt out of your talk was this shift from the emphasis on um, uh, religion and on Shiism, then more towards nationalism, which seems that every ruler at some point realizes that perhaps has more value amongst the population. And it's something that, you know, during um, Ahmadinejad and particularly Esfandiyar Rahim Mashoi, when he started this discourse of uh, uh, Islamic Iran, you know, Islamic Iran, which of course lost him many allies amongst the Lebanese, Hezbollah, and in the Arab world, and they thought, you know, what is that pre-Islamic Iran, but certainly catapulted him, um, raised his profile as well as his popularity, not that it did him any good, I mean, you know, we're no, we know where he ended up, but um, quite a few uh, uh, questions already. If I uh, start uh, with, there's, there's a whole range um, of a topic. So uh, we, we have uh, one that, for example, I mean, I'll read them out as they come, Nagis John. And it says, you know, every single speaker thanks you very much for this fantastic talk. And it starts with the first question, it refers to, you know, Ibn Khaldun and his ideas on Asabiya. Now, if I'm, I'm no authority on Ibn Khaldun or Asabiya myself, if I no, this was some of the quotes about tribalism and clan solidarity. I think I stand to be corrected on Asabir. And it says that uh, to offer, explaining how the Iranian revolution has arguably lost its way in the last 30 years. I presume if I just pl pluck that out, and please audience do correct me if I've misunderstood by Asabir. But if we take on this idea of tribalism, do you, if whatever you'd like to frame as losing its way in the uh, 30 years, obviously that means probably post-war, do you think that's accurate? Do you think tribalism has a place in that? Do, 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 do you think the revolutionary guards have lost the clan solidarity from the time you spent with them? Well, the Revolutionary Guards never really had clan solidarity because they're not, um, it's very different from like the armed forces under the Ba'athists in Iraq um, or even even Syria. And so the, the Revolutionary Guard actually very much, and even if you go back to their earliest media productions and you talk to, and you know, I interviewed, especially from that first generation of uh, over 150 members of them, they, um, it really was, especially for the beginnings of the revolution, it was about 
uh, a Shia and Islamic understanding of Iran and also a national very much because of the war. And, and this is the other thing. It's very difficult to talk about the revolution and separate that from the war because so much of what ends up happening because it comes on the heels of that. And so for this question, I don't, it's an interesting question and I haven't thought about it in this way. Yeah. And I and I appreciate the 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 person who asked this because I'm gonna sit down and think about this more. Um, but you know, this question of having lost their way, mm. that is something that I would push back on a little bit because I think I'm not here to say that they have lost their way or they haven't, but I think actually um politics and especially revolutionary politics. I mean, I think that we study the Iranian revolution very differently than we study other revolutions. And I don't quite understand why. I mean, I, I have ideas, but I, I, especially talking at a university, I think that we should, when we study the French revolution, we don't just siphon it off at a specific period and say, well, there was, there was a French revolution and now it's done. Mm -hmm. in, in the Iranian context, it's very similar to all of these other revolutionary states in the, in the sense that the revolution is, is something is is and especially a revolution like Iran's, which was a massive uh, uprising from below. There is a lot that changes in a society when there is a massive uprising like that from below, and that part of what the Islamic Republic has tried to do because of the power struggles that are endemic to revolutions is they've tried to demobilize the population from the beginnings of that revolutionary period, and the war obviously helped them de demobilize. But in the aftermath of the war that mobilization from different sectors has come out in different ways, whether it's civil society, whether it's activism, whether it was journalism, whether it was the art sphere, whatever it might be. And I think that we need to understand the revolution of Iran as, first of all, not just tied to the Islamic Republic, but understand it as a much wider social and cultural phenomenon. And then also understand how the Islamic Republic attempts to uh, respond to these different mobilizations that happen across uh, across society. So I'm actually not ready to put the death knell in the Islamic Republic because for as long as I can remember since I was a child, everyone was ready to put the death knell in and they it's we've been proven wrong. So I think that we need to have a different framework by which we sort of view these things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, that was by Ian. If I move on to a question by Bruce Stanley, what type of uh, relational networks link these filmmakers to other allies or filmmakers outside Iran in other cities around the world? Is there a network? Um, That's a great and, question. Yeah. So and, part of, yeah, sorry. No, 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 I was going to say with the emphasis that the, the relational network with allies uh, and filmmakers, yeah. So part of what these filmmakers, regime filmmakers in Iran, part of what they're consistently disappointed and angry about is the fact that uh, the Qayda Khwadi filmmakers, mm. the, the filmmakers that are not part of the regimes, that the ones that have gotten all of this, um, uh, you know, uh, attention in the outside world, the Asfai Farhadis, the Kiro Stamis, all of, all of these folks, um, they, they think from their point of view that it's because they have all of these pre-existing mm. connections and networks and, and social and cultural capital to diaspora Iranians and to Westerners who are anti-Islamic Republic. And so from their perspective, their work is not being shown to that degree outside because they don't have that. Now, some of them, actually their work is not being shown because it's not very good, but they do have talented filmmakers as well. And so part of what they're trying to do in relation to the question that you're raising is trying to create allies and networks where they can show their work outside it's very difficult for them. One of the, one of the things that they try to do is, uh, and one thing that I've been tracing out is looking at their connection to Latin America, especially Cuba and Venezuela. Yeah. They've created His Hispan TV, which is a Spanish language television station. Um, so there are, there are ways in which they try to do it. They do show their work in different uh, film festivals, especially in developing countries. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. but this is very much an issue that they have and that manifests itself i have a whole chapter in the book which is basically about this fight between pro-regime filmmakers and writers 
and and filmmakers that are part of the Feda Hodis mm. and how the, the fight comes to this question of we may have power in Iran, but but our work, especially as filmmakers, cannot circulate in the ways that it matters as artists on an international well, scale. How how uh, um, uh, recipient are the internal uh, media and broadcasters? I mean, do they get their films on uh, IRIB or Sedosima or whatever? I mean, are they, do they have you know just an open door? Uh, from the state uh, apparatus for, in terms of support, financial support, um, media exposure or not? They have, um, a lot of it depends on who the producers are and, and what kind of connections their producers have. They don't, they don't always ha have an open door. It depends on the channel on television. Sometimes the directors of certain channels are more open to newer ideas or newer kinds of media and sometimes yes. they want something. So again, it, it's really context specific, um, but no, they also have to fight. Um, and again, one of the things that I try to bring out in the book and that's playing out again now in different ways is that when Ahmadinejad took over, when his administration took over, they pushed out the folks who were pro-regime but did not agree with Ahmadinejad. And so all of a sudden those folks become, uh, they're trying to figure out ways to get access again. And um, so, so, you know, being pro-regime is, is often not enough in and of itself. It also requires lots of other contingent factors such as who, who can connect you to those who are in power today if your side is the one that's not in power today and things like that. Um, but, but still, nonetheless, they are able to get more resources than an independent of filmmaker course, who doesn't course. have, right? Absolutely, so, yeah, and there's probably no shortage of funds um, uh, for them. Um, uh, just moving, obviously, as you can imagine, this has led to all sorts of secondary, uh, tertiary uh, questions. And one of the things that is uh, of interest for several uh, people have questioned that this discourse of nationalism. And if I mix a few questions that obviously the uh, public are slightly more emboldened on various national days that there are all the slogans about the pre-Islamic regime and um, you know, a longing and nostalgia for that, that if that is one side of nationalism. And another question is that transformations towards nationalism within Iran. And are there any leads that you can have for, you know, people who are working on this discourse? Are you yourself um, interested or not? Are you working And that? How is this uh, notion of nationalism versus Jews and manifest itself. Obviously, the, the range of questions are some that are this nostalgia or longing or perhaps looking up to the pre-Islamic regime and for some, as you said, born out after the revolution, a new nationalism emerging from uh, Islamic Iran. So part, part of what's important about the first half of that question is that what I, I'm describing and what I sort of talked about here is the regime media world, but mm. the regime media world doesn't exist in a vacuum. It, no. It's a part of a, I mean, media on Iran, media about in Persian that gets broadcast into, it is a mass and, and vast uh, uh, expanse of, of a media world is sort of, we call it and what we study. And part of what's been happening actually from places like London is that there have been these uh, very wealthy stations that have started up like mm -hmm. Mama Tote Television mm -hmm. that broadcasts out of London, which holds, um, it seems to be much closer to the pre-revolutionary government. And Manoto is, I find, a, a very, very fascinating place to study. I hope somebody out there is studying Manoto actually in, in these critical ways. Because what I find really fascinating with a place like Manoto, and I saw, I think this is part of the question that you're referring to, Nargis, is, um, you know, the, these protest slogans that have come out in support of um, the pre revolutionary uh, or, or, you know, uh, path navies. Um, and part of that, I wrote a very short piece about this a couple of years ago, but part of that, I think you have to trace out these media narratives that are coming from places like Manoto, that are coming from places like Iran International, other, other, other sites around, um, because they are working on this question of nostalgia. They are working on this question of a particular kind of nationalism. Now that doesn't mean, and I'm, I, this is what I don't want to come across. Media is not so simple whereby you put a narrative out there and then people yeah, are just stupid and they take it yeah. in, right? It's not yeah. a, you can't, you can't, it's not a shot. You can't give it to people. So people take it in in various ways, but 
over a long period of time when certain narratives are built and, and sustained, they do create some kinds of social realities. And so uh, thinking about the nostalgia for the old, I think it's also very, very important to look at these kinds of diaspora media productions and what the, the types of messaging that that's coming out. As far as Shiism um, versus nationalism, I would actually say that I think we have to co complicate this a lot more. And, and it's not Shiism versus nationalism, yeah. but it's, it's in some ways, as you had said before, referring to folks around Ahmadinejad, this particular kind of Iranian Islam that they have been um, working on and articulating in various ways in Iran. And, and I think that, that that, you know, understanding that, and it's, it's also not just post-revolutionary Iran, these things, I think another thing for those who are interested in studying these things is to not think of 1979 as this cutoff period where everything changes and everything before that is something else, but to try to understand the continuation of these things. And, and especially with media and narratives, what is grabbed on from the pre-revolutionary period that sort of sustains itself afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've said, I, mean, I, I get very cross sometimes as if, you, you know, the uh, revolution, whatever one's relationship or reception of it might, it didn't just pop out of nowhere that this is the, the fact that on either side within Iran or not, at the same time, whether they uh, congregate around Orangahe Kurosh and all that, never mind the Pahlavi, absolutely um, ancient Iranian rhetoric. And then they might go back and do a Nazrin Imam Reza, that it's not as if Shiism and Iranian nationalism are so easily to separate and vice versa here. It's not a, um, the most ardent monarchist might, must, or might also be extremely religious. It's not a good Shi. And it, it's, um, uh, I'm, you know, glad that it's much more complex than that. And the media that you mentioned, it's uh, obviously Iranian, whether it is um, IRIB or independent uh, Basiji filmmakers or whoever, that they are very sensitive to the power of these external forces and because they're very, they're very quick in responding and producing a domestic version. If it was Manutos Befarmoid Shum, come dine with me, which in itself is something out of ITV or Fame Academy. Within months, Iran produced a version of that, and therefore, and also something much more easy to access. It didn't wasn't interrupted. The signal wasn't interrupted. So it's not as if they are just working in isolation uh, for that. I'll go back to the uh, questions. I have a. Um, a question from uh, uh, Professor Arshin Adib Mugaddam, who sends his greetings to you, Nargis John, and a wonderful talk. And um, he says that, uh, you know, you discussed anthropology or refer to, to anthropology as a discipline that heeds the subjectivity of the other. Uh, in that regard, how easy or difficult is it to study Iran the way you do under the current social political circumstances in the United States? That's a great question. So first of all, hi, um, Aishin John. It's, I, I wish we could be seeing each other in person. Um, okay, so that question, um, I think in the past four years since Trump, this project would have been pretty much impossible um, because we are in a, for all intents and purposes, a, a situation of, of war and maximum pressure on Iran. And, and, and we can see this in the ways in which Iran has unfortunately, um, you know, uh, put increased pressure on academics and researchers. So uh, in, in this particular environment, I think it's very, very difficult. But I do think that regardless, um, especially if this Please correct me if I'm if I'm not taking this question in the, in the way that you want me to. But I'm I'm going to sort of direct it a, a lot to to students and potential researchers yeah. of Iran. Yeah. There are so studying places like Iran are difficult. It's difficult. It's not easy, and it requires you as a researcher to do a hell of a lot of homework and legwork before you actually begin the research. I mean, I. As someone who grew up in the United States, I was born in Iran, but I was four when we left. I knew that if I were to go 
just based on my summer uh, trips to Iran to visit family and my Persian and, and, and that I had taken in school and all of this stuff, that that would not be enough for me to, to be able to really do this kind of in-depth work because I needed to find a way to, first of all, for myself to understand all of the different levels of complexity of, of the post-revolutionary state and society in Iran. And what that required of me was spending years and years in Iran, really working on my Persian, really working on learning how to come in and out of these different social spheres, understanding how I came across, uh, trying to work on my habitus in a place like Iran versus who I am in the United States. And that's not to say, and again, I talk about this a lot in the book and also the article that I had mentioned before, which I wrote last year about how to do research in authoritarian spaces which is that you have to be fully honest about what it is that you're doing, because especially in places like Iran, because if you're not, then that, that means potential, you know, you, you, you go off, off into prison because you, you know, th that raises all of these red flags. But also it means that um, you have to, I think for, for students and, and for me, this is what I took away from it, is to, is to understand that no matter what the stories are that you grew up with, whether you grew up in inside Iran, outside Iran, wherever, whatever country you're working on, that in order to undertake this type of research anthropologically, it means that you have to have a respect for how people make sense of their world and of their lives, even if that's not how you make sense or the people that you love make sense of it. And so for me, in order to even get to that point, it took so much of prep work because I had to work past so much of what I had read, so much of what I had heard growing up that was all very valid at the same time. But I had to come to understand that they, the folks that I was working on, also had their valid stories. And for me, and, and I know you're not talking about writing here, but since Nargis had brought this up earlier, it also meant that during the research phase, one, the biggest part was just listening. I was constantly listening. I was constantly trying to take in. And then the second phase was coming here and writing. Mm. And, and in the writing stage, I mean, I was in day in and day out with people that I didn't agree with. I respected them as human beings, but I didn't agree with them. And it was very, very difficult to try to write past that. And there was lots of moments when I was angry at things that I saw. And it, and it was about, I think the writing phase is also about research, which is how do you make sense of the things and how do you analyze it and do it in a way that I think, especially for those who do anthropological or ethnographic work, at the end of the day, they gave me so much of their time. And I know that if I gave a researcher access to the, to the level that they did to my life, they're gonna find things that they really don't like about me either. And, and yet it's about how do you respect mm -hmm. that invitation, but still re remain and create a critical distance that will allow you to give analysis that is critical and that is not just about what they told you. Yeah. Well, I, I, I no, 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 it was fine. And Arshin thanks you for being candid and um, so honest. Um, uh, there, I mean, we've got quite a few questions, but I tried to pick ones that from the theme. So one from uh, Roger, Hig Roger Higginson, and again, uh, thank you for your fascinating talk. From all the interviews that you conducted in the course of your research, did you get a sense overall of the extent to which the government of Iran either is or feels itself to be more or less stable today uh, than say it was 20 years ago about the you know the confidence of the state i suppose and their um you know a longevity that they see will not be threatened yeah, that's a very good question um so i think as far as regional issues are concerned they feel extremely stable and confident um and uh especially in comparison to 20 years ago when it comes to domestic um I, I, would not, I would not say that they feel extremely confident, but I also wouldn't say that they are fragile. Um, and so I think that the answer lies somewhere in between there. Uh, I think especially when, when you know, I, I think when, it, when they're left to, when it's too, left to their own devices without this sort of extreme external pressure that the United States has imposed on Iran over the past four years, mm -hmm. especially, um, they, they understand that they, they know, they know that they have a lot of problems. They, they know that they have a, an issue of communicating with their younger generations. They know that, that a lot of the younger generations have 
feel like they can't um that the, that the state is not theirs anymore that the government is not theirs and so they they understand that this is an issue and again remember it's because so much of the first generation of of those in power today in iran yeah. came from a revolutionary moment and so they understand that but um but this kind of extreme pressure it, it exerts a lot of anxiety but it also um they are able to use this pressure to talk about external external forces it, right? right and and mm -hmm. and that is is a way to stabilize what is going on internally once this external pressure releases itself if it does then i think that their conversations will slightly change again and that is what i you know in, in doing this research in the aftermath of 2009 i started the research project in the summer of yeah. right after the summer mm -hmm. and so there was when they were discussing a lot of these kinds of issues too and they know they understand that they're not blind to it now, can they respond to it? That's a completely different question. But but I think on a regional level, they're very mm. confident. They're very confident. And a question very much to the point uh, from Sarah Thelbeck. That have you had any feedback from uh, your subjects about the book you've written? Um, I've had uh, some feedback. We're getting it translated into Persian. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm a, I think I will have more feedback at that point. Um, but um, I have had some feedback and and, and they've been um from what they've been able to to see from or glean from it because a lot of them don't read english well enough to be able to, to sort of get through a book uh, a book length manuscript yeah. um, but that is it's important for me and and that is why i'm working on having it translated into persian yeah a couple of questions about this uh, absolutely uh, people will be dazzled by the fact that you really pulled off this project and uh, where they're again because of being a female. Um, and uh, uh, they just want to know what was it, just a little more about the environment that you were operating with, the boundaries as a woman in such a male environment. Just a few more reflections or yeah. snippets. There's several questions about that. Sure. Um, so, yeah, it, it was um, first, it was not easy being around military folks in general, I don't I don't come from a military family. It's a different way of being. I've also done research and interviews and work with US vets. Um, mm -hmm. I'm working on a separate issue on, on chemical weapons and depleted uranium yeah. use. It's also difficult for me in those situations. So one is being around folks who are just sort of mil in a military environment. Yeah. But then the, the gender issue, um, yes, look, it was, I mean, there were moments when, when I would like leave Iran in the middle of research and I would get on a plane and I would just sort of let my body go. And I felt <laughs> like I had been, it was like, I was stone. everywhere was just stone that I had been holding myself in so much because I had constantly had to be aware of my body language. I constantly had to be aware of, how, was I smiling too much? Was I looking too directly at people? Where was I positioning myself in the room? How were, how was I sitting? Was my head job okay? You know, and and I talk about this a little. I write about this in the book, but like I did not, I didn't change the way that I wore my head job. I wore it in the same way that I would outside in, in a non-research environment, simply because I knew that if I tried to look more pious, I would come across as faking it, and That's I didn't right. want that to happen. So I, I just owned who I was. But assuming who I was also meant that I, um, it, it, the, uh, women in that world, uh, it took a lot longer for them to warm up to me. Um, the men in the first generation, uh, it was hard at the first, but then they really took me under their wing, especially the ones who had daughters. Because I was more or less, and I didn't wear makeup when I was doing research, so I looked younger. And so I was more or less around the same age range as their daughters, especially those who were older. Um, and so for them, those who had daughters really took me in. And, and I didn't realize this until sort of the end of my research. Because I was like, huh, why is it that X, Y, Z, all of these people are like so good to me. And then those people are just ignoring me. And I realized the common denominator was that they all had daughters around my age. Um, the younger guys, the third generation, that took me a very long time to get mm -hmm. to access to because those guys were very close in age to me. Um, it was very difficult for them to... Um, to talk to me, to, to sit down and have interviews with me. We had to figure out ways in which it was not crossing any social or religious or uh, red lines. So that that those relationships took the hardest, took the longest and were the hardest for me to build. Um, and but, um, 
uh, uh, there is an interruption, I mean, you know, interceding by Anthony Wynne, who says that surely that must have actually been an advantage, perhaps, to be a woman in that uh, environment. She was obviously perceived as so much less of a threat. And uh, did, did you feel that? Did you think that at times it was actually an advantage that you were a yeah, I, I somebody's daughter? So I think that, yes, for the daughter of ones, for mm -hmm. sure, because they took me in both to protect me and, and also to teach me. And as a researcher, especially an ethnographer, you, I love it when someone thinks that they have to teach me things because that's when they get really start talking and right. And yes. they're, they're showing you what they know. Yeah. Um, so in that way, it was definitely an advantage. I think, I know that there are some personal things that they may have not said to me that they may have said to a male researcher. I don't know, but I think, um, you know, regardless, yes, there were some limitations, but I do think in some ways it also opened some doors. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe there are two things that obviously this is the, the questions addressed to you as possibly an analyst looking at Iran. I, for example, what next for the IRGC after um, Ayatollah Khamenei's uh, demise, but perhaps, you know, keeping the media. But there, and there's a question from a journalist from Iran. I think he's there right now. Um, uh, Kenta. Um, Ijimia, thank you for this great presentation. I am Kenta Ilijima, a Japanese journalist and a SAS alumnus living in Tehran right now. After the death of Qasim Soleimani, we have many media things in relation to Soleimani, including the, the advertising boards, tra uh, traffic intersections, documentary books, TV programs, and so on, as well as street names and squares now named after him. Uh, what do you think, and you just briefly uh, touched upon this, uh, what do you think the regime's aim is by representing Soleimani in such a um, you know, media uh, uh, produced um, a presentation? And do you think, are they being successful? I mean, their use of this multimedia um, uh, having him there in all the billboards or advertising or whatever. So that's from a, a Japanese colleague in Tehran. Sure. So this question of success um, when it comes to media is, um, is, is a question that we sort of have to take a longer term analysis of because um, especially when it comes to state propaganda or when it comes to advertising even, um, it's not so much whether any one product or even one series of products works or is successful or not. The mere repetition of it over a long period of time creates certain realities. Now with Soleimani, I think what's really fascinating for so with Soleimani, and I followed around some of his media team in Iran and I write about it in one of the chapters in the book, is that Soleimani was different because he was, prior to Soleimani, usually the, the pro-regime media would uh, focus on martyrs very much. And they realized that young people just didn't care about martyrs because they, they it felt, you know, like this was a long time ago. Um, and so they wanted a live hero. They wanted to present a new hero that young people could relate to. Soleimani became that in many ways. Uh, and, and it was quite successful, actually. Um, and now with his death, the way in which he was killed factors in so nicely to all uh, narratives that are extremely powerful in Iranian society, uh, whether from Imam Hossein to right, like to to understand how the United States killed Soleimani in another country when he was there on an official on an official trip, fits into this broader conversation and narrative about. Uh, standing up to the oppressor. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, it's actually, they're able to fold it into some of that type of narrative already. And this is why you see so much of his face everywhere, of his media images everywhere. Now, will the, what what's going to be the repercussions of this or how will people feel about this? I think it's a little bit too early to tell, but one of the things I think is really fascinating. And I think as a journalist, I think especially to think about related to Soleimani is his daughter. Mm -hmm. Soleimani is taking on the man the public mantle. She is extremely well versed in media, a very, very outspoken in Arabic, in English, and in Persian. Um, so I think one of the things to pay attention to 
moving forward and, and sort of looking forward is these younger generations, both the men, but especially the women, because they have a lot of resources at their disposal. The women, especially Hezbollah women, have been, they are much better organized than their male counterparts. I mean, it's actually, it's not really that surprising, right? They're much better organized. They are extremely committed. Um, and they are, they are, they are, they've taken a big turn from their mother's generation in which they are completely comfortable being in the limelight and being in the spotlight. And so I think Soleimani today falls into a lot of the narrative of martyrdom from the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. What happened to Soleimani before his death, I think, was very new in the Islamic Republic. But now it sort of goes into that narrative of the past. But I think instead, what we should look for is people like his daughter, the children of these folks, and the ways in which they either continue or swerve a little bit mm -hmm. on the messaging of their families. Yes, yeah. and they are they've sort of as is, as the daughters have bid their time. They have observed. There's so much more um, street savvy as well and of, but of course she has been quite a divisive factor some see her as incredibly privileged and having just you know inherited this yes. um uh wave of popularity even those who were not necessarily a supporter of Soleimani, the manner of his demise yes. as you know won people over um a, a, an interesting question i like is from Muna Ajir that as she shifts the balance to uh aspirations and motivations for the Basidis. Uh, it says that uh, there is still a religious motivation. Do you believe, Narigis, that there is a, a religious motivation still amongst the new generation of Basidis? Or is this now back to social mobility and Iran's um, uh, drive to be independent? Obviously, the sanctions, if one thing has taught Iran, uh, its need to be independent are the sanctions. But do you think now the revolutionary zeal is really an aspiration for, uh, um, uh, you know, mobility, uh, social mobility? Did that come across? Um, so there, yeah, yes, religion still very much matters to um, to to some folks. Yeah, yes, it matters to young Basijis. Um, religious, r religion and piety wrapped up into uh, the political discourse of that generation, I think is also extreme. So it's not just about social mobility by yeah. any means. There's, there is a deep commitment to the, the, the Nizam, to the, to the system. There's a deep commitment to Iran as a sovereign independent nation and a deep commitment to that, at least in its current iteration, under the leadership of Khamenei. The younger generation of the Basijis are, are very, very committed to that. There are people within them who get into these, who, who get into this organization for social mobility, for sure. But that doesn't, I don't think that we can extend that all throughout that of generation. That um, and so, um, you know, I, I think, and, and here's what I will say that I think is very different from when I did my research to today, is that the actions of the Trump administration, I think, have fundamentally made certain kinds of impacts, not just among those who are regime loyalists, like these young Bastiges, although I think it has furthered their commitment to, um, to Iran as an independent nation vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Um, but I think it's also, again, you know, since I focus so much on, on, on generational learning, one of the, and I used Carl Mannheim, who's a theorist on generations, and one of the things that Mannheim talked, uh, wrote about quite a bit was that the need for some kind of fresh contact mm. for a generation in order to be able to experience something. The war was that for that first generation of Basijis and Revolutionary Guard. I think Syria, the, 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 the fighting in Syria, and then really importantly, Trump, and, and what he's done over these past four years is that fresh contact for this young generation that did not, that grew up under a state talking about imperialism, but it was state rhetoric. 
It was not a felt kind of imperialism. Right. Yeah. So what you have now in Iran is that you have a generation that much like actually the generation of the 60s and 70s who was, who was clamoring against imperialism, mm -hmm. you now have a felt experience of American imperialism in Iran yeah. in a way that's different from just rhetoric. And I think that that then tied up and mixed with your question about um, religious piety but it's not just religious piety, it's religious piety combined with a, a, a certain kind of political um, commitment mm -hmm. to uh, independence vis-a-vis -vis imperialism. Those are combining now yeah. for this one generation. Yeah, I'm conscious of several questions coming in and I, I don't want to uh, sound as if I'm picking up on questions which uh, move the narrative towards the popularity of or the you know, ardent support uh, of the Qasim Soleimani, even those who weren't necessarily religious came to it, or the abhorrence of um, sanctions. But some say that, you know, but there are protesters who openly, boldly set fire to Qasim Soleimani's banners or pull these banners down and stamp upon it. Or the fact that um, uh, uh, there, there were disheartened Iranians when Trump was declared the loser, that they actually thought that perhaps might have been the one and only chance of, um, uh, you know, relief from the internal oppression. Um, and there are no, these are perhaps more common, uh, but I, you know, I just wanted to say that, you know, there are a couple of uh, our participants who say that these are not, uh, and you, as you yourself have said, it's not, Iran is not a one dimensional, uh, country and of course I don't think any observant of any society would um, reduce it to just this polar opposite but um, uh, I don't know whether I mean I I, I don't watch a huge uh, number of uh, films that have come out of Iran or I mean I saw a couple of Dehnamaki I thought he was again very much ahead of the game and how popular he was and his clever way of playing with the name of football teams and of course, uh, you, you know, the Estegrol or Azadi or all of those, that this is, are you, are you conscious of that in your writings? Are you aware that there uh, perhaps even these young filmmakers with, with their own agendas know that somehow various things no longer, the, common, the, the currency, the value of, uh, nationalism, their idea of nationalism versus the same generation who wants simple liberation. They're not anti-Iran, they're not all queuing to leave Iran, but certainly just want a little more air to breathe in. And do you think these third, fourth generation very soon of Basijis are aware that mm. um, they, they, they are, they, they're their brother, their classmate, the other side also wants a tribune to. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, first of all, yeah, I mean, I, I think if I were here saying that this is what pro-regime filmmakers make and therefore look, it's successful in Iran, you guys would have to boot me out of even being here. Um, <laughs> because I, I, you know, just as you were saying, social analysis and cultural analysis has to fundamentally show how these things bleed into one another and how incredibly complex it is. And if we don't show that, then we are not being fair or truthful in our analysis. And so part of the, the questions that you're raising, yes, of course, in Iran, um, there are many people who many people who disagree with this with this uh, with the Islamic Republic writ large, and then a lot of the messaging that comes from it. And coming from a family who is that, I was hearing this all the time when I was doing my research in Iran, and I also showed a lot of these films to especially artists who were not part of the regime in order to sort of glean their responses to what was going on. Um, but nonetheless, I also think that there is something that we have to pay attention to, whether one agrees or not with the Islamic Republic or any state actually around the world. Mm -hmm. You have to understand how state power works via state messaging and, and even the, the ways in which that kind of messaging may work when you do not agree with it. Because that, if you understand that, you understand how power, parts of how power work. 
And that is, is a fundamental for me, it's a, it's a sociological, political, cultural question um, that I think is important to understand irregardless of where your political uh, affiliations lie. Now, and by ignoring it, it doesn't mean that it goes away. Now, in, in response to the question about, or the, the follow, following on from your question, Nagus, about um, the, uh, do, does this younger generation of SDGs understand or see their, their counterparts? So I, I want to respond to this in two ways. One is that one of the things that I saw as being a, a moment in which they begin to shift how they think about the future of Iran, especially these younger Basijis, is when they have children. Mm -hmm. when, when they have children, they have to think about the future of Iran for their children. Or this is at least how they articulated it to me. That I began to see a significant change in political outlook among my interlocutors when they had children. And it was because, as they would say to me, yes, I still believe in the ideals that I had in the past, but I want my daughter, son, whoever, I want my child to grow up in a stable Iran. Mm -hmm. And so that meant that for them, a stable Iran meant an Iran not involved in either domestic or international turmoil and upheaval. So at that stage, you know, the quote that I read from one of my interlocutors who had accepted his uh, award last year after the November 2019 uprisings, and he said, he turned and he said, if you sat on Imam the cats, the heads of the, the yes. state, you need to uh, not turn Iran into Syria. These are folks who mm -hmm. grew up believing 100% in the Islamic Republic, but now have children. I mean, he was up there accepting his reward with his daughter in his, in his lap and another one at his knee. And I think it's important to understand that. However, again, these things are very, very fluid. So you have a situation now with especially Trump and with everything that is going on. I, I think the, 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 the events of the past few weeks sort of lend our, uh, themselves to thinking about this. With Fahri Zadeh's assassination in Tehran, and then now the, the execution of wow. Islam, journey, what yeah. you have is an, a, certain sectors of society in both the state and the opposition want division, because when you have division, yeah. you're able to, to rally forces, right? And so when you, with the execution of Fahri Zada and Zam, I think it's important to look at, for example, uh, how those within the regime media world who I follow and look at are now attacking certain cultural and intellectual elites and celebrities, as they call them, who came out and said, you shouldn't have killed Zam, but did not come out necessarily and say anything about Fahri These are, these are cultural, mo cultural nodes that they try to use to pin different parts of the population against one another. This And this is nothing that is just exclusive to Iran or the Islamic Republic. Look at what's happening in the UK now with Brexit, for example, in the United States with steal the we vote, do. the elections, right? These these cultural wars in effect are, are and in the social media world are utilized extremely effectively to pit different parts of society to get against one another. And so I think that, uh, yes, there are those in the third generation of the Bastille who understand, may not, don't agree with those of, of their cohort who wants a different kind of Iran, but understand that things need to change. And then there are those, or in moments like this, where they, they end up retrenching back into what, what they believe and the other side may as well. And so I think, again, none of this stuff is ever, we can't freeze it in time. And so we have to understand how these things shift throughout time. Yeah, well, that's a, I think that's a very appropriate good moment to uh, begin to wrap the talk. There are several questions there that simply are fascinated about how you set about organizing your research and they hope that perhaps you could come up with a toolkit for how, as a young woman, how you even begin to organize um, and prepare for research in a conservative, closed society. So I think we may have to have you back on it. We could have a round table of uh, uh, people who have taken this. And absolutely, I think we all take our hat um, off to you. I think you must have had the most well-behaved dog who did not snore once, certainly I didn't hear it, and a very well-behaved child who probably desperately now wants her lunch or something, <laughs> saying, come and look after me now. Nigel, John, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to have you. You have uh, made us sit up and take notice of so many things that get lost in the 
big stories. We forget about all the other um, currents in uh, such a relatively young society. Um, we thank you very much um, to have you as the author of Iran Reframed. I recommend our participants to definitely uh, get this book. I think Aki has very kindly put the, uh, in the chat room and the anxieties of power in the Islamic Republic, which as you said, is just the beginning of the study of this revolution. So um, thank you very much indeed. Thank Please you for come me. back. Wow. Uh, we'll be eagerly waiting to hear about your next topic and to our wonderful audience who have said, uh, been with us all evening. And um, I wish you all a very, Happy uh, festive season, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year under lockdown, wherever you might be. All the socially distanced exchanges of gifts, I hope, and Yalda and winter solstice and Hanukkah and everything. We will be back with our Tuesday lectures. Uh, Dina and I look very much forward to welcome you back on Tuesday, 12th of um, uh, January. Um, when I hope we can bid farewell to this wretched 2020 and how wonderful to have you Nargis John to wrap it up for us. Best wishes with all your projects and teachings and we'd love to have you back very soon. Thank, thank you so you. much to everyone who came and thank you Nargis John, Not it was a pleasure talk. to be here. Pleasure, so I say good night uh, from uh, London Middle East Institute to all of you, stay safe.